Hey everyone, welcome to another session of Virtual Global Spine Conference. Um, really honored to uh, be able to introduce Dr. Barry Barsley. Uh, Dr. Barsley is a spinal oncologist at Memorial Sloan Kettering Hospital in New York City. And I first heard Dr. Barsley give a talk on minimally invasive spinal oncology applications back at Spine Section in Vegas. And I was absolutely blown away by, uh, by his talk. And, and um, I'm really excited for him to give this for all of you tonight. So uh, welcome, Dr. Barsley. Thanks for being here. Uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me? I don't, just making sure. Yes, we can hear you. Awesome. We can yep. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate the intro. It's a real privilege being here tonight. What you guys have done with this uh, educational platform is really uh, outstanding. And uh, I really thank you for doing it. So it's a real privilege to be here tonight. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, advances in spinal oncology. Uh, we're going to talk about minimally invasive approaches, robotics, uh, and some kind of personalized uh, treatments if we have time at the end. All right, let's get going. So I have no relevant uh, financial disclosures. And really, when we talk about spine oncology, uh, what spine oncologists, including myself, what we like to talk about is, you know, end blocks and primary tumors and kind of big wax. But what we actually treat is mostly spinal metastases. So uh, with everyone's permission, that's where I'm going to focus my talk tonight. Uh, but I will try to show you that uh, over time, we've been going from this to this. Uh, in, in the process, our ORs have gone from this to this. So, so there's a lot more kind of technical complexity, but we're making things smaller and better for our patients. I'll kind of walk you through the steps uh, that I've been taking uh, within this uh, realm of spinal oncology in the past few years. Uh, talk about a little bit of improved uh, construct, really the increased importance of quality of life, minimally invasive surgery, including endoscopy and robotics. Uh, and then again, if we have time, uh, talk a little bit about basic science about targeted spinal therapies in the tumor microenvironment. But I can't really talk about kind of all these advancements without talking a little bit about the steps that came prior to that, about the evolution of spinal oncology, the rationales and indication, integration of adjuvants, including radiosurgery, the types and extensive procedures and the multidisciplinary effort. Uh, so I'll start the talk with a little bit of that and then kind of move from there. I think what's really key to, to remember is when we talk about spinal oncology in general, but particularly for metastatic disease is what we're aiming for. And we all worry about uh, maintaining and preserving neurologic function, about local tumor control, pain control, spine stability. But really, uh, I think we've all come to the understanding that the key element is patient's quality of life. And when we talk about metastatic disease, we always go through patient uh, uh, framework and, and a huge shout out to Mark Bilski and Ilya Law for my mentors for, um, uh, for, uh, for this uh, uh, huge contribution. And we talk about the neurologic, the oncologic, the mechanical and the systemic aspects of this. When we talk about the neurologic uh, piece, we talk about myelopathy or functional radiculopathy and mostly the degree of spinal cord compression. And to that end, there's the epidural spinal cord compression score or BILSI score that classifies tumors as low grade versus high grade, uh, low grade being uh, um, zero, uh, a, uh, one A, B, and C. And then there's high grade, which is the SEC two or three, where two is compression of the spinal cord with CSF uh, still available, uh, evident versus three where there's no CSF. And this is what it looks like on MR, uh, grade zero, uh, this is probably like a 1B, a grade two, there's still CSF, and grade three, this is a spinal cord here with no CSF around it. Uh, we talk about the oncologic part is really what we expect the uh, response to our proposed treatment to be. And historically, this was all predicated on radiation. And again, historically, this was all predicated on conventional external beam radiation. Uh, and when you irradiated certain types of tumors, you got good local control. And you, when you irradiated others, you had very poor local control rates at, at, uh, uh, and definitely not durable. So based on those assessments, uh, tumors were classified as radiosensitive versus radioresistant, where hematologic malignancies and some uh, solid tumors like breast and prostate were classified as sensitive versus uh, others like uh, non-small cell, renal cell, sarcomas, et cetera, which were uh, radioresistant. And really the best evidence that we have that patients benefit from uh, surgery is, comes from the Patchell study. This is now almost 20 years old. Uh, Lancet trial that, that really showed that uh, surgery plus radiation was better than radiation alone uh, across the board for everything that we care about, patient ambulation, continence, uh, narcotic use, and, and even overall survival. 
Uh, and really based on that, there's been a strong recommendation by the spinal oncology study group since then that patients with high-grade spinal cord compression from solid tumor radio-resistant malignancies go sur undergo surgical decompression and stabilization followed by surgery. The question really was what type of surgery and what type of radiation? And when they tried surgery plus conventional radiation, essentially, if you wait long enough, everybody fails. So 4% uh, um, local control in four years for these tumors with conventional radiation. But then came along stereotactic radiation, uh, which allows higher dose per fraction radiation with, uh, it's, it's clearly more technical and labor intensive, but it really allows higher dose to the tumor with less normal tissue dose. And there is a ton of data today to show that this really works. And essentially, we're overcoming radio resistance. So there are really no radio resistant tumors in the spine. It's just a matter of dose. This is a MSK series, 811 tumors. 82% uh, of them were radio uh, resistant. Uh, and uh, none of these went to surgery. These are all low-grade low epidural uh, cord compression. Uh, and essentially, if you deliver a high enough dose, we get 98% local control at four years. So it's really, what really matters is being able to deliver a high enough dose. More recently, these are two landmark trials in radiation oncology, the Sabre Comet and the PISA trial, both showing uh, even further. So if you treat locally with stereotactic radiation or ablative radiation, it doesn't just affect what you do, what we get locally, it actually improves overall survival. So treating patients with oligometastatic disease with ablative radiation improves their overall survival. And the PISA trial showed that dose matters here too. So the higher the dose, the better the chances of overall survival for these patients. Ultimately, what this results in is a net increase in spinous BRT across the board and internationally, everywhere you look. We know that it comes with the complications and radiation myelopathy is rare, can occur, but it's very rare. Vertebral compression fractions are not so rare, uh, anywhere between 13 to 40% in different publications. Uh, and we always say that that's something we can deal with. Uncontrolled tumor, we are very poor at treating, but uh, uh, by fractures, we can stabilize. So what happens when you deliver radio surgery to patients with high-grade spinal cord compression? This was explored and, and essentially uh, you either underdose the tumor at the dural margin where you need it the most to prevent spinal cord compression, or you overdose the spinal cord, and uh, that resulted in significant failures. This is uh, an analysis of failures from Michael Lovelock, and, and we, we kind of know the doses that we need. And essentially what this shows is that you need a certain distance from the spinal cord to the tumor for you to be able to deliver that high dose of radiation that you actually need. And that's how a uh, hybrid therapy uh, came to play, which involves separation surgery, which is a very simple uh, and reproducible surgery. It's a posterior lateral only approach for circumferential spinal cord decompression and stabilization. Uh, so a patient with high grade tumor will have that type of surgery uh, and that results in, in circumferential decompression. And then they go to uh, uh, stereotactic radiation uh, for the uh, local control. And this is not a new concept. There's kind of, uh, um, you know, this is our uh, kind of way of uh, doing it. It's kind of a widely available uh, 10 steps of how to do it. And this is something that I really encourage everyone on this call to be familiar with because this is something that is easily reproducible everywhere. And we know that it works. This is, sorry, Michael, you need to say something. Right, I just want to see if I can ask you a quick question. I've, I've got to scrub sure. it into a Sorry. Um, so how, how much of the vertebral body has to be gone for you to be comfortable with just instrumenting doing separation surgery without performing any to degree of anterior column reconstruction, whether it be a cage, some type of a strut or, or cement yeah. recon? So that's a very good question. I mean, I, I often take probably, I would say, I mean, I, I think the real key is you have to do a real good bilateral uh, drill out the bilateral pedicles very well. And then when you get ventrally, if you take the PLL and push the tumor ventrally, you know that you should be well enough for set for um, uh, stereotactic radiation. The question of reconstruction, the anterior column is a big one. Uh, we have been transitioned. So there's, there's different kinds of approaches. I have to say I've transitioned away from cages and more into augmenting with cement the vertebral, the, the vertebral bodies for multiple reasons. I mean, uh, we see a ton of cage subsidences, especially if there's uh, tumor progression in the adjacent segments. There's issues with scanning and getting MRIs to kind of uh, um, follow our patients long term. Uh, but it really doesn't matter. You know, wh whatever you want to do to get a circumferential decompression is fine. I really find that, uh, you know, getting 
20% of the vertebral body should be kind of more than enough for you to get that circumferential decompression. Uh, all of this is assuming that you're kind of prompt getting your patients to radiation, right? So we actually do the planning or the simulation probably post-operative day two or three while they're inpatient and then send them out to radiation, I would say probably 10 days later. And then have you ever run into any issues with, with wound problems due to the fact that you guys are sending them to radiation so quickly after surgery as opposed to waiting three or four weeks? Yeah, no, with steroid, I mean, for conventional, I, I wouldn't send them, uh, we'll, we could talk about that later, but and for open surgery, I wouldn't send them for, for uh, minimally invasive I have and with, without real penalty. For stereotactic radiation, there's no issue, and I, I'm, I'm okay with them doing it post-operative day one or two, and it takes them a few days to plan it, but whenever, essentially, whenever they're ready, uh, they can do it, unless it's protons for whatever reason, but, but for photon um, stereotactic radiation, there really has been no penalty. Okay, great. That, that, that's great to know that I'm sure a lot of people in the audience are uh, thinking about as well. Okay, yeah, awesome. And if anyone has questions, feel free to stop me at any time. Um, so going back to this, we know that this um, um, strategy works. Uh, this is uh, uh, an analysis of 186 patients treated with this separation surgery followed by stereotactic radiation. Uh, and if you give a high enough uh, uh, dose, then you know you have over ninety percent local control. We went kind of deeper in the past few years into uh, we know that they do well from an oncologic perspective, but how do they do as far as uh, um, uh, quality of life and, and uh, patient reported outcomes? And this is an analysis of uh, prospective analysis of uh, patients who underwent this treatment with the MD Anderson symptom inventory and the brief pain inventory, and and we can see that. Uh, there is a significant and durable improvement in, in patient-reported outcomes uh, using the strategy for, for patients with metastatic disease. We can predict who will do better as far as quality of life. We know that patients who come in uh, worse perceive greater benefits, or if they have higher ECOG scores or lower Asia and MRC scores, they do better as far as their perceived quality of life. Patients with lumbar tumors usually come in with a higher uh, threshold or a higher degree of pain, and they have a bigger delta of improvement. And women, uh, for whatever reason, do better than men post-op. We know that patients, this is part of a multi-center study with the AO spine, a knowledge forum. We know that patients with significant neurologic deficits have a poor prognosis. Um, they are able to uh, improve neurologically sometimes after surgery. We're working hard on trying to predict who will. Uh, but essentially, um, it's key to identify these patients early on before they fall off the cliff, because once they fall off a cliff, it's much harder for us to bring them back. And essentially, all I've shown is that we've transitioned from this. So this is a T10 renal cell metastases. And, you know, not too long ago, this would be a pretty straight, or I would say pretty uh, clear decision to go for a, an end block spondylectomy, uh, which is a safe and feasible procedure, but, uh, but, but still is a major procedure. And we transition really to this. So with radiation, this is a 20 minute uh, treatment, no blood loss, and we have 98% control at, at uh, four years. So this is kind of a no brainer today. And for those of you kind of wondering about renal cell, we went and looked specifically at renal cell carcinoma. This was recently published or this year in uh, neurosurgery. Uh, we uh, uh, evaluated 90 patients with renal cell who has separation surgery only. So we are able to control the bleeding. I can assure you that uh, with separation surgery without doing uh, an end block or without doing a full corpectomy, uh, it tamps down and, 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 and it always stops. And this is, uh, you know, we have 92% local control at three years for the survivors with, uh, with kind of low complication rates. We know that patients can survive longer today, and we also evaluated what happens to our long-term survivors. And we do see delayed hardware failures, sometimes after two years, we do see delayed um, wound complications to Mike's previous point, sometimes also greater than a year, uh, especially with the new targeted therapies. Uh, but, but really this is kind of durable and, uh, and uh, with low complications rates. Um, so ultimately what this uh, has led to is that we know that um, uh, now, this is actually a multi-center study of Michael Failings and JCO. It's probably five years old now, but surgical intervention as an adjunct to radiation and chemotherapy, we know that it provides immediate and sustained improvement in pain, neurologic, functional, and quality of life outcomes. And that's kind of, I would say, the standard of care today for metastatic disease. Switching gears to the mechanical aspect. So mechanical instability is a separate uh, indication for surgical intervention for this. And, and 
uh, the spinal oncology study group. This was a project uh, uh, done several years ago, developed the spinal instability neoplastic scores uh, that uh, takes into account six components, the, the location, the pain, the quality of the bone, the spinal alignment, the degree of collapse and posterior element infiltration. And, and when you tally them up, you get uh, a score that um, um, identifies patients as unstable, stable, or potentially unstable. And if they're unstable or, or, or potentially unstable, they benefit from seeing a spine surgeon. And then we have different ways of stabilizing them, uh, kyphoplasty, minimally invasive, or open uh, uh, um, fusion. And that really led the way for minimally invasive surgery. And, and it started all with uh, just kind of percutaneous screws. Uh, but then over time, there have been, um, you know, kind of a, a wide array of minimally invasive techniques for separation surgery and for others in metastatic spine disease. This is a really good surgical video by Reza Azari and the guys from Monty uh, showing how to do it. This is available online. Um, and, uh, you know, even you can actually drop cages and do uh, transpedicular corpectomy. This is Dean Chow's work of uh, 2014. This was published, so it's been over a decade that these things have been kind of around. And what it really means is that we, we took techniques from trauma, from degenerative disease, and, uh, and incorporated them into spinal oncology, so percutaneous screws, rods, and tubular or expandable attractors. And, and this is a good example. This is a 66-year-old lady with uh, non-small cell lung cancer presented with severe mechanical back pain. Uh, and she had multiple level of disease. He had fractures of T7, 8 and high grade compression with progressive myelopathy of T10. But rather than doing a large open procedure from, I guess, T5 down to, uh, I guess, the lumbar spine, then I uh, was able to do a, a minimally invasive approach. So uh, percutaneous screws, rods, cement augmenting the vertebral fractures and, and just kind of doing a um, um, a minimally invasive separation surgery, um, and, and she's now three years out with uh, good local control. And we can really do this minimal access surgery decompressions throughout the spine. We can do it in the cervical spine, the thoracic spine, definitely the lumbar spine. We know now we, we looked at this also prospectively. I know that when we look at the quality of life for these patients, they again do very well as far as the pain, the disease interference, uh, spine specific questions, they all do very well. We have algorithms available to kind of, uh, um, I guess, reproduce how we think about this, especially for the thoracolumbar the fracture. So if de decompression is required, then we decompress with a tube or, or uh, uh, and, and percutaneous the instrument. Uh, if, we, if we have cord compression, but it's a radiosensitive tumor, we can still do just perk screws and send for radiation. But uh, if we don't need to decompress, there's a question if the posterior elements are involved. And if they're not involved, then kyphoplasty will work uh, as a standalone procedure. And if they are involved, then we probably augment with screws and rods. Um, we've hey, Ari, <clears throat> may, I, may I ask you, this is Alexander from Switzerland, um, yeah. may, may I uh, just jump in, can you please go one slide back and can you, uh, can you give us an amount, uh, a percentage, how many um, patients do you um, do step one, step two, step three, what do you think, um, you, are you able to uh, solve the majority with minimal invasive uh, um, techniques or is it just like 50 percent um what is real life telling us in numbers yeah so i think that's a very good question i think that is you know a very kind of surgeon specific uh, i think it's mostly what you're comfortable with uh, i will show you in a, a few sides that we're getting smaller even for those that are not comfortable with minimally invasive techniques um, I would say that probably greater than 50, I, I am able to do minimally invasive surgeries for greater than 50% of my patients for sure. I don't always choose to do that. Uh, there are, you know, minimally invasive surgery requires probably more time. If you have to do bilateral tubes, then you either do, you know, kind of two separate stages or you have a co-surgeon resident fellow that is able to work through a tube separately and then you can work bilaterally. Getting through the bilateral pedicles ventral to the retubal body can take time. So it really kind of, um, it really kind of uh, is very patient and surgeon specific. Um, but I think to your point, greater than 50% of patients, we are able to do minimally invasive surgery on for sure. Okay, thanks. Yeah, of course. 
Um, so again, actually to that point, you know, we've started using a lot more uh, cement augmented screws, which has allowed us to actually go shorter on our constructs. So with minimally invasive surgery, we started doing a lot more short segment. The traditional separation surgery would be at least two above and two below, if not three above and three below. And we're now going short. And that is kind of with kind of with very low complications rates. So when you add the cement and, and if you aggressively cement, there's almost no lucency. Screw pullout rates are very low. We are seeing pedicles fracture with progressive kyphosis and some caps popping off, et cetera, but the rates are kind of low. And that has led, and that's to my previous point, that has led us to actually also do this for open surgery. So we're now, rather than the traditional two above, two below, uh, we're doing a lot more short segment separation surgery. So open midline posterior approach for posterior lateral decompression but only instrumenting uh, one above, one below with cement. Uh, and that also appears to be, uh, at least a kind of in a short-term experience, that appears to be safe uh, with low complication rates. So then when you think about minimally invasive surgery, I think what comes to mind for all of us is spinal endoscopy, which has been booming in the past few years. Uh, and, and it's kind of the least invasive uh, spine procedure available today. Uh, and, you know, we're, we're a cancer institution, so all I do is can well, essentially all we see is cancer patients here. And the question is, how do we uh, implement that for our patients? And for me, it all starts with just getting experience, right? So this is a, a gentleman, 74-year-old with, uh, with urothelial carcinoma, did not have a spine-related issue. Uh, I'm sorry, a spine cancer-related issue, but he had just a disc herniation with extreme pain and was unable to go through his uh, clinical trial. He was uh, admitted in IVPCA, et cetera. So he did an endoscopic discectomy and he was able to, he went home same day and was able to, to do his uh, clinical trial the next day. So based on experience with a bunch of these patients that we started using more and more endoscopy for, uh, we tried figuring out how do we implement this for cancer? Uh, and this is one good example that I have been uh, using and have another kind of option in my toolbox is patients with mechanical radiculopathy, right? So we need to do a nerve root decompression. And I've showed you previously that it can, can be done open or can be done with a tube, but it can also be done with the endoscope. So this is a 70-year-old gentleman with uh, metastatic renal cells, post-stereotactic radiation. He was doing well, but then collapsed and now had severe intractable pain. So we needed stabilization and decompression. Uh, and again, that can be done with a tube or it can be done open, but I elected to do this with percutaneous stabilization. And then, you know, with the endoscope, you can actually add in drills and kerosens and do the same uh, type of decompression, except even with an even smaller incision. So it's not even a Wilsey approach, you can come transferaminal. And I think for me, what this has led is that I have another option uh, for patients who have failed for patients with multiple previous surgeries. If I am worried about wound issues for whatever reason, then having a less than one centimeter incision is really a non-issue anymore. And this is kind of a really good option to also have, and it's feasible and it's safe. Is there a role for tumor resection with the endoscope? I won't show any slides of kind of separation with that. It can be done. It's not ready for prime time. I think with what we have available, hemostasis is an issue. And if, you know you end up kind of staring at a red screen for a while, and, and I'm not sure that that's safe enough, but I do think it will be in the future. But sometimes it is, and this is, I'll switch gears for a minute, and this is not a metastatic disease, but this is an osteoblastoma. Uh, this is a lady that presented with uh, an osteoblastoma, right? And this is a, a L4-5, and she was offered a facetectomy infusion uh, elsewhere. Uh, and then she came to me and said, you know, okay, is there a way to do this? Uh, and, uh, you know, we tried it with the endoscope, and I think there's you know, more things that we can do with this. You can see that there's a different... Uh, you can see the kind of the, the small rim of bone that was overlying it, the different color between normal and uh, unhealthy bone. And then you can also add the ablation. She's now four years out. She, she went home the same day and she's four years out with no recurrence uh, and doing very well. So I think the endoscope does have a role. Uh, but actually, you know, kind of starting to do uh, endoscopy uh, and looking up at a screen and working through tubes with the microscope kind of got me thinking about other things. And I will now switch gear for metastatic disease and, and kind of talk about some of my path with um, robotics and, and where that has led me. So kind of just, just um, uh, looking up at screens and, and, and having a different point of view got me thinking about all these tumors that, you know, this is on top, it's a meningioma, on the bottom, it's a schwannoma, and you all have these videos and nothing has changed for probably 40 years for these. Uh, and the question is, you know, is there something that we can do for benign or for nerve sheath tumors? 
And I think really the only thing that has changed uh, in the past couple of decades is that they've been, you know, people are starting to treat, uh, certain physicians are starting to treat them with serotactic radiation. This was pioneered in uh, Pittsburgh, uh, in Stanford, and they show really good local control. Um, and it's actually becoming a lot more common, at least in the U.S., that pe people are getting tre you know, treating their benign nerve sheath tumors with serotactic radiation. We here still do not offer that as upfront uh, treatment because we don't have uh, data about malignant transformation. Based on what we know from acoustics, I believe the chances are probably, you know, the rates should be extremely low, but we still don't know that. And we also don't know how they do as far as pain. And based on the publications that are available, probably only about 30% of them really have a meaningful uh, pain response. So to that end, we looked at our series of, of uh, intradurals and we again showed that uh, surgery, this is a pretty difficult benchmark for radiation to beat is that you know with the, with the surgery for benign intradurals, patients do really well clinically immediately and that you know we know that that's uh, also uh, true for the from the oncologic perspective. So really across the board, everything that you look at patients do uh, immediately very well. And minimally invasive surgery has been implemented for benign intradurals, um, meningiomas, schwannomas, mostly it can be done through tubes, uh, expandable or tubular, et cetera. There are people starting to do it with the endoscope. It's a little bit more complicated. But that got me thinking about robotic surgery and got us actually thinking about that. And we talk about robotic surgery and spine. Typically, we talk about uh, essentially smart devices that align our trajectories for screws, for cages, et cetera. Uh, but really not so much about robotic arms and the feasibility and the usability of robotic arms is something that um, I think is underutilized in neurosurgery or in spine surgery in general. Uh, and actually, uh, the first kind of time this was tried here was uh, uh, by a thoracic surgeon here with Mark Bilski kind of uh, guiding him uh, to resect a, a paraspinal schwannoma. And that got us thinking, you know, what would happen if uh, a neurosurgeon was trained to actually do these procedures, and will that lead us to advance the field of robotics and getting just our hands in and getting our comfort zone kind of uh, um, uh, expanding our comfort zone with this? And really, we started doing so. I was trained to, to use the Da Vinci robot, and I always do this with uh, co surgeons or my access surgeons. Uh, we do this together, and we started with kind of, you know, I guess I would say more trivial cases. Uh, that don't really infiltrate the spine much, but over time, uh, we've gotten a little bit more uh, advanced. So this is an L1 schwannoma. We know how to uh, put in a stimulator through the Da Vinci. Um, uh, and uh, we have, this is a video that's been, uh, uh, that was published uh, last year. But then we started getting even more kind of, um, uh, I would say aggressive with this. And this is a, a 21 year old athlete that came to me after, uh, with this because he heard that we were doing some robotic surgery here and uh, you can see a giant schwannoma here it's uh, I think uh, 15 centimeters in diameter uh, and he was offered a huge thoracotomy which is probably what you would need to do for this but we were actually able to remove this with the robotic approach minimally invasive approach getting the tumor out was our biggest challenge so we kind of put it in a bag and then brought it up and made a one inch incision on the side of his uh, uh, thoracic cavity uh, and then kind of chopped it up and and he went home same uh, next day and two weeks later was back to um, uh, active uh, sports. And then over time, we got even more kind of comfortable doing this and, and started doing this for functional nerve sheath tumors. So on the top, you see uh, the type of visualization that you get and why it allows us to do this, right? So this is on the top, it's an S1 presacral lesion and the bottom, it's a T1 lesion. So the presacral lesion, uh, we're looking kind of top to bottom and we dissect it out. Uh, we will see soon, we stimulate the nerve root to make sure that we're not uh, taking a functional root. Uh, and then at some point we take it and we're able to remove the whole thing on block. Uh, and the same happens uh, for the bottom video. If you could see, we found the T1 nerve root. We make sure that, again, we're not resecting anything functional by stimulating it. And if you've ever done a high thoracotomy for a paraspinal T1 or for a spinal paraspinal T1 lesion, you know that that's an extremely morbid procedure, uh, and patients really suffer from it. Sometimes uh, it's it's really it's it's just very morbid. And this uh, patient with a T1 uh, tumor went home as outpatient, so she went home from the recovery room. And I think that's kind of a huge step forward. Uh, sorry, let me see if I can move forward. Okay. Uh, and then, you know, we started thinking about bone work, and that's kind of a major limitation, right? So this is a, a patient with, uh, we thought this would be a plexiform tumor, but it actually ended up being multiple schwannomas in a schwannomatosis patient. 
Uh, and once we resected the tumors that were uh, kind of easily approachable, we were struggling to um, reach the ones behind the rib. Um, and to do that, we either had to flip the patient and open from the back uh, versus what we did here, which is that actually brought the endoscopic gear into the robot and was able to resect the rib from uh, within and then use a kerosene and actually remove the, the rib head also. And that really gave us all the space that we need to complete the surgery. Uh, and so we don't have drills available yet for this, but I think once we do have drills with robotic arms, there's uh, a an enormous amount that we can do with robotics um, uh, for these lesions. It's not always a simple single step procedure, but we can make, you know, incorporating everything that we have from going smaller on our spine mats and going smaller on our constructs, uh, we've kind of incorporated that into these as well. So this is a gentleman that came with this nerve sheath tumor and, and progressive myelopathy. Um, this uh, obviously needs a fusion, so it did short segment uh, separation essentially here. Uh, you do it from the back, decompress the spinal cord, take the nerve root here, and then when we flip them over, it's a pretty straightforward procedure now uh, to remove this all rather than doing a big thoracotomy or, or a long kind of incision. It's a pretty straightforward procedure. Uh, and you can see that we end up, we can see our drain and uh, the construct on the other side. And this is another example, hey, right? Hey, 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 Ori, uh, I, I'm so impressed by your uh, videos. Uh, but I just, it is the Da Vinci uh, robot uh, you're using. So you're not holding the instruments. You are in your box and you're using the joysticks. And what we see is the robots. Um, and I think uh, those uh, perhaps uh, in the uh, participants who don't know how this works, it is pretty amazing because uh, the the uh, the perhaps you can describe uh, the setting because you are not in the sterile field, uh, you are two meters away. Um, can can you just describe? Yeah, that's absolutely those? that's absolutely right. So uh, once you position the patient, you make uh, and and again, I uh, to be safe, I always do this with my co-surgeons. Uh, this is a case, for example, with uh, Bernie Park, he's a thoracic surgeon, and, you know, they kind of do this um, uh, every day. Um, the robot, uh, you, you insert the trocars, you uh, expand the space, and then you have four or five different uh, arms kind of inserted into the patient. Once you settle it down and you lock it in, you have three robotic arms that you can control at a time. Uh, and one more that an assistant from the outside can help you with. So that's how we kind of change and get stimulators in or, or whatever else we need. Uh, and then there's two consoles, one for the surgeon who is, uh, who is actively kind of working and another for the assistant uh, that doesn't control it at the same time. And you kind of switch back and forth. And I think that's really, that's a, a really good point that you brought up uh, because that um, relationship is what's driving us forward because each one of us is comfortable in different areas. Uh, so for them being near, you know, dissecting the aorta off or, or you know, the lung is, is nothing. And I kind of, you know, my, my heart starts beating really fast. But when we get near the neuroforamen, I'm more comfortable and they're not comfortable. So I think that relationship sitting together and operating together at the side of the patient is really what's driving this forward. Yeah. And, and the movement with your instruments, like turning the, the tip of the movement, like 180 degrees, making a rotation. This is not possible with your own hands if you have these uh, instruments in your hands. And this is unique. And this is something what the robot, we have a Da Vinci in our hospital as well. But the masters are from urology, urology and OBGYN and abdominal yeah. surgery. And I'm always impressed. And I'm, I, I will fly over to you for my appendectomy, I can tell you. <laughs> I, I don't know that I could do that safely, but but uh, I think I, I really think so. There's a learning curve, and what the, you know, there are masters with the robot. It's very different. You don't have a tactile feedback. You you have to rely on visual cues. So it's a very very different type of surgery. Uh, but I'll show you in a minute that the visualization that you can achieve with this, and actually the angles that you can work with, uh, really open up uh, options for us. You know, and I'll show you one case in a minute that kind of highlights that. Uh, this is just another one that, you know, you can be very aggressive with this uh, gentleman with extreme cord compression here. Uh, this is just, th uh, this here is the cord right here uh, who came in with this uh, uh, schwannoma, essentially. Uh, and, you know, again, short segment, I, I dropped the cage here because he only had probably a third of his vertebral body left. 
uh, and, and did the whole decompression. And then again, when we flip it over, this is kind of trivial. But what, what, I, what I want to see here in this video is that when we come from the back after we remove the tumor, you can see that we, you know, the cage is there and there's things that we can actually do. So once we have the proper instruments, I think there's a ton of spine work that can be done from this approach, spanning multiple levels with just, you know, kind of these minimally invasive approaches. And I think unlike the path that we usually take, so going from degenerative disease or trauma to tumors, I actually think that this is going the other way. And what we're learning here from tumors will actually lead us to a lot more, a lot broader um, indications for robotic surgery and spine in general, once we have the, the right tools for it, but we're kind of not there yet and working on it. Uh, so to your point, uh, so to my point earlier about the huge advantages here with both the angles and, and the way that you can work and the range of motion that you have, but also the visualization. This is a uh, lady from actually last week, uh, uh, an L12 nerve sheath tumor. We were following this for a while, but she became intractably symptomatic and it grew. And unfortunately it actually grew into the spinal canal, into the an intradural. And uh, this is New York. She saw probably four or five surgeons and everyone offered her facetectomy infusion, which is probably the right thing to do. But based on our previous experience, uh, we elected to do this uh, robotically only. And, and you can see some of the toys that we have now that make this safe. This is over the psoas. We use an ultrasound to make sure that we're in the right place, even though we kind of know this is dissecting the psoas. And this is, uh, you know, if you've ever done a lateral approach, then you know that this view is kind of amazing. We dissect the muscle off the tumor and find the, the, uh, the nerve root. But then because we have such a great view, and this is something that, you know, at least I couldn't do this open with loops or with a microscope, when we get near the foramen, we've started kind of going one layer deeper into the pseudo capsule. So we, we have this amazing view. And once you get into that pseudo capsule, we can actually slowly tease it out of the foramen and not encounter CSF. I'm saying that because we've done it before and we did not do that and tried to kind of remove the whole thing and we have encountered CSF. Uh, but now we've learned that we can actually remove these tumors from outside in. And this tumor uh, came, you know, all of it in one piece from outside in. Uh, all that was left was a pseudo capsule. We suture it after so acid, and this patient also was uh, free to discharge from recovery room. So, well, uh, I've never, I've never thought that this would be possible. Uh, yeah, I mean, honestly, may I, may I, may, may I ask you, Ari? Um, you, you, you can do endoscopy. You can do robotic surgery. Um, and I, I know from my personal experience, it takes a long time. Um, who can teach you this? Um, uh, are your teachers able to uh, use the same technique? Do they have the same portfolio of, um, of um, um, surgical steps? So I think that's a, a very good question. I think, I think the two are separate. So endoscopy, um, you know, I think there's masters of endoscopy in the world today. Um, um, you know, I think uh, there's a, a ton of masters for in, in Asia, in Germany, in the US. Now there's there's really people who are uh, extremely proficient with the endoscope. And I think, uh, um, you know, that's something that can be, uh, I think, more easily taught. And uh, applying it to spinal oncology is a little bit more challenging, but uh, it's essentially the same surgical techniques. The robot is a little bit more challenging. Um, it was even challenging getting certified to use it in my institution. So I had to go through training courses and essentially it was, I was not, and still not certified to do this alone, only with a co-surgeon or an access surgeon. Um, there's online modules. There's, uh, I did a ton of hours on a simulator uh, and ultimately just working with my co-surgeons, right? So we saw their names on here. This is Alvin Go. He's, uh, um, like you said, he's a, a GU, um, master robotic surgeon, Marty Weiser, Valerie Roosh, Bernie Park. They're all masters of robotics. And I'm actually get, you know, my mentorship actually came from outside uh, neurosurgery or spine surgery in general. Um, so I think it's a real process and you have to build a relationship uh, with uh, colleagues from other disciplines. Uh, but ultimately, hopefully in, in some time, then I think we'll be able to teach each other, but, it, but it's definitely a process. Oh, thank you. Um, so um, I, I actually like this slide. I think whenever we kind of uh, uh, integrate new technology, there's always a, um, a period of uh, huge excitement and then inevitably something bad happens and we're kind of depressed and ultimately there's uh, it, it all kind of balances out to 
uh, a realistic place that you know, that's meaningful. I think for robotics and for endoscopy, we're probably just at the beginning of this. And I think uh, there's still so much that we can do. Uh, and I think this will drive um, these technologies into other aspects of spine surgery and probably neurosurgery in the future. Okay, so we have a few minutes left, and if everyone's still awake, then I'll kind of uh, uh, um, uh, talk a little bit about, go back to my metastatic disease uh, and talk about the systemic aspects and steps that we're making uh, for as far as uh, mostly the tumor microenvironment and targeted spine therapies, and what does that mean for us as spine surgeons? Is that, does that actually impact us at all? And I think uh, um, when we talk about the systemic aspect, it's mostly all uh, predicated on are our patients going to tolerate our proposed treatment, right? So that was the uh, notion that led us to quality of life, to smaller surgeries, et cetera. But I, I think we still struggle with that. Uh, the first question that comes to mind is, are, you know, uh, a frailty, and there's been uh, several attempts of frailty indices to try and kind of quantify who are the high-risk patients. Unfortunately, none of them really work. This is kind of a recent analysis that shows that they're not really reliable yet. Uh, we came up with uh, an ERAS protocol. So again, learning from the degenerative uh, di uh, disease world, this was actually a, um, a project that was led by Ilya Lofer to develop uh, an enhanced recovery after surgery pathway for patients with metastatic disease. And this is something that uh, is implemented now to all our patients. We then looked at our results and saw that uh, 200 patients post ERAS and 200 patients that we did not implement ERAS on. And we, and, and we found that just implementing an enhanced recovery protocol um, resulted in significant improvement in, in outcomes, early ambulation, early discontinuation of foleys, and ultimately probably lower UTIs, post reduction in post-operative uh, opioid consumption and shorter hospital length of stay. And this was true for both open and ERAS uh, and MIS patients. And ultimately, you know, all the incorporation of immunotherapies or targeted therapies, ultimately they all have led to increased survival for metastatic disease across the board. So for pretty much every uh, histology, we see that our patients are uh, living longer now. And, and that kind of maybe um, uh, forces us to uh, shift paradigms and try to identify who those patients are. There is a ton of data on uh, molecular markers and what that means for spine oncologists or for spine surgeons. And I think spine surgeons today that will eventually see a patient with cancer in the ER um, should be familiar with some of these. These are two good reviews, uh, but I won't belabor all of this. And, you know, I won't go through every a uh, new targeted drug that uh, uh, is available for every disease, because as you can see, it's just overwhelming and there's not much that we can actually uh, make of this. And I think for me, the question is, how do we really incorporate all this into what we do into our treatment paradigms? It's not a new concept. Uh, these are kind of two uh, nice studies, one by uh, um, uh, Charles Fisher and his group looking at non-small cell lung cancer systematic review, and they show that EGFR uh, is an important prognostic factor for those patients. And John Shin group uh, showed that patients who fail immunotherapy for melanoma are probably uh, uh, not good candidates or, or do worse following spine surgery for their Mets. Uh, this is actually our paper that came out today uh, in neurosurgery. It literally came out a few hours ago. We looked at the impact of targetable mutations on patients with non-small cell lung cancer who were treated with hybrid therapy, 103 patients. So no, all patients were treated with surgery and followed by stereotactic radio, radiation, SBRT, and no uh, conventional radiation in our group. And we looked at uh, the treatment, whether it was EGFR, v VEGF, different chemotherapies, uh, um, you know, kind of multi-TKI inhibitors, immunotherapy, we looked at different mutations and we tried to correlate those with outcomes. Ultimately, we see that for this, even though it's not small cell that was traditionally radio resistant, we, we have 95% local control at two years uh, with this strategy for our patients. But interestingly, it's not just that EGFR matters. So patients who you operate on that are EGFR mutant, but treatment naive, have uh, a better prognosis. But if you catch them on the downslope, so if they have already been treated with EGFR therapy, they have an EGFR mutation, but they failed their EGFR treatment, then they lose that advantage. Uh, and that really you know, matters to us, right? Because it kind of shifts the way we think of, you know, do we need to do a bigger procedure, maybe more durable constructs, maybe we need to do less, maybe not surgery at all. And, and I think incorporating some of these data is, is important. And I've started kind of having this discussion with my patients 
um, about this. We also have a clinical sense that patients with colorectal cancer don't do as well. So we looked at that as well. This was recently came out in World Neurosurgery. Uh, we looked at 50 patients with this strategy and we saw that they actually don't do as well, you know, but, but still good, 86% local control for this group. Interestingly, about 40% of them had progression outside the index level. So it's, it's prudent to follow up with uh, uh, imaging and to make sure because they will fail distant, uh, uh, distant at distant locations for sure. We did find a signal for the APC gene that probably is a worse prognostic factor. So if your patients have APC, they probably are worse, but the numbers are too small to kind of make a lot out of it. Started looking at, you know, is actually, uh, are samples from spine tumors actually relevant to this? We know that throughout the metastatic cascade, there are, uh, there's a mutation cascade that happens and, you know, are the genomic findings from spine meds even relevant. Uh, and we, we compared primary tumors to the spine meds, and we found that there's a high concordance rate for the genetics between primary tumors and the genetic alterations, particularly when we did a subgroup analysis for known driver mutations. And we know that you know, it is reliable, and we can look at the microenvironment from our samples and kind of study that. Uh, and the patients, that, I'm sorry, patients, the people at uh, MGH have kind of been knocking this out of the park. These are two really, I mean, these are worth a talk on their own. Uh, papers from MGH uh, showing um, single cell RNA analysis. This is for the microenvironment of bone in um, uh, prostate cancer. They found that uh, there's an infiltrated uh, T cells are exhausted and dysfunctional. But even more interestingly, uh, they found a specific pathway that when they disrupted that pathway, it relieved the exhaustion uh, and extended survival. So what they do locally, again, affects what happens systemically. And that really sends us all the way back to the uh, papers from the radiation oncology. And I think that's probably going to be very meaningful for us too. In the end, this is another paper from that same group, uh, uh, single cell RNA, and they found kind of a transcriptomic signature for patients with renal cell. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll kind of skip over a little bit. Um, but, you know, do these come into play for predicting or prognostication in spinal oncology? And we know that there are, you know, several well-known uh, scoring systems to try and predict survival in spinal oncology. This is the Tomita score the Takahashi score, the Bauer score, and the SOR genomogram, all of them try to predict survival probability. Uh, but unfortunately, none of them incorporate any genomics at all. And I do think that that is key today. So what we're trying to do right now, this is uh, our recent work using um, OncoCast, which is a machine learning algorithm that uses large-scale mutational data uh, for genomic-based stratification of survival and survival prediction. It's an open source algorithm. Uh, we, we, we looked at 285 samples taken from the spine, genomic data from the spine. And you know, just kind of briefly, when we looked at breast cancer, we found that estrogen receptor one and P53 are poor prognostic factors, and that's in line with what's known in the literature. But interestingly, when we plug it into our machine learning algorithm, you can now stratify your patient into two risk groups, high risk and low risk, where the high risk group have uh, 21 months of overall survival and the low risk group have 70 months at, uh, of overall survival. We did the same for lung cancer. So men amplification is a poor prognostic factor and as expected EGFR and ALK fusion are um, a good prognostic factor, which is in line with the known literature. And again, when we, plug that into our um, machine learning algorithm, we have two prognostic groups, high risk and low risk, and the high risk group will have a, a probability of um, uh, median survival of nine months and the low risk of 32 months. And I, I think this all really will affect the type of surgery, the extent of surgery, and really the informed decision that we have with our patients. And I think it's coming very soon. I don't think this is something that's going to be for the next generations. So to summarize, I mean, this is how it all began. I think these were all very separate radiation, surgery, and systemic. I think this is where we are today. Surgery and radiation are very much enmeshed, but systemic treatment is starting to really come into the play. But I think that in the very near future, this will all be kind of one uh, big pot and, and uh, they will all uh, play a role together. And I think it's our uh, responsibility to kind of figure out, you know, I think surgery is definitely going to continue to play a key role in this. We just have to kind of figure out uh, what that role is and how to make it better. Thank you very much. That's all I've got for today. I'm happy to answer any questions.
Wow, Ari, this was really an awesome, awesome uh, synopsis of, uh, I think, tumor spine surgery of the future. Right? <laughs> this is really nice. Um, Ari, may I, may, may, I, may I ask you, just um, for, for me to understand, um, uh, 20 years ago, uh, there was this tumor patient. He was operated by the surgeon, and then he was sent to uh, oncology for, for the next steps. Uh, today, it looks a little bit different, isn't it? Uh, I think you spent a lot of time in uh, interdisciplinary conferences pre-op. Um, you are um, taking a part in, in the discussion, decision-making, who to operate and who to, um, who, what is the, uh, the timetable of the treatment of every patient individually. Do, do you have uh, do you have the time to to make trauma calls as well and all this <laughs> degen stuff or are you absorbed uh, totally by tumor spine? Uh, so I mean that's an easy answer for me. Uh, we, you know, uh, MSK is a cancer institute, so uh, we essentially don't. All I treat is cancer. Uh, we don't have uh, trauma patients and. Uh, I do treat, I guess, DGEN in cancer patients. So as I've shown, we, we do have a population that really needs that. And we kind of walk the line with very sick patients treating their DGEN when they really, you know, when, when they can't um, go on to battle the cancer. But uh, I think it is time consuming and I think it is very, it's becoming subspecialized for sure. Uh, but I think the, you know, some of the more common concepts should be familiar to uh, the average spine surgeon who takes call uh, because I think you know we want to keep patients safe and uh, doing short segment separation surgery is some, I think is a surgery that um, uh, is obviously super useful and I think uh, not too complicated for an average spine surgeon. Uh, I think if you want to do minimally invasive procedures and you want to get kind of more subspecialized, then it, it definitely requires time. But um, but I, but I think a lot of these concepts are probably uh, widely applicable. Yeah, um, this was just an opening question. Um, uh, the outcome of uh, for the patient, uh, for the outcome for the patient. I think it's very good proven that um, if you send these patients to centers with high volume. Um, treating every week the same condition or similar condition, um, then uh, it, the, the outcome survival rate is a lot better. Um, now that I mentioned this, it, it is not uh, bragging if you agree. Um, do, do, do you see a, a great step forward if you compare to uh, the survival rates in your center like 10, 15 years ago? Or is there a stagnation? Is there no improvement in the last two, five years? Um, I think, you know, the, the, I, I showed a paper by um, Robbie Rothkorf, uh, um, and then they kind of looked at it here. I, I, I think there is an, an incremental improvement. I mean, the cancer world is changing so rapidly, and every day there's a new drug, and every disease has a new clinical trial. Every, I mean, it's, it's so hard to follow. I don't think there's stagnation. I think there's, um, um, you know, we're, we're getting more advanced with the radiation here they're starting to uh, be more comfortable with even grade two compressions just to upfront stereotactic radiation i think there's you know there's things coming there's intraoperative reiki therapy that's available there's i don't think i don't think that we've seen the end of it and i don't think we're at the peak i think we're going to have long-term survivors i think the percentage of patients who survive longer will continue to grow and I think the outcomes will continue to improve worldwide and not just at specialized centers. I think it starts, but it trickles down everywhere. Um, I have to say, I think it's sometimes not easy. So when you're, when you're in kind of a, a small local hospital, you don't really get the same patients that we do. You often get the emergency 2 a.m. paralyzed patient in the emergency department. That's a little bit more challenging. Uh, but I do think that, uh, you know, what you said is true and, and working together with multidisciplinary team and specialized centers is better for patients and, and uh, uh, you know, encourage everyone to send their patients to those places for sure. Okay, thank you. I've got, I've got two more questions. One is from the uh, auditorium. Dr. Birchok um, asked uh, in cordoma, in a sacral cordoma, um, when there is no need for, um, for surgery, emergency surgery, it's an elective setting. 
um, do you do radiation therapy therapy as well in Cordoma, or uh, do you have some entities uh, where you still say no, it will not work? Uh, so I purposefully I didn't go into Cordoma in this talk. I think that's a very very uh, controversial and complicated topic. Um, I have to say, I think for sacral card cordomas, uh, the world is kind of, lent, uh, I mean, I think for a lot of primary tumors, or for most primary tumors today, we know that uh, there's probably a role for surgery, but there's also probably a role for radiation. Uh, we know that the combination is probably, um, probably provides better local control long term, and that's true for cordoma as well. Um, Sacral cordomas are, are tricky, and um, um, in this institution, we try to treat them with radiation. We have really good, uh, and I can send that later if anyone's interested, feel free to reach out, but there's papers out there showing uh, good results with, uh, with radiation only. But there are cases where we definitely think that, you know, primary sarcomas, uh, et cetera, that we do, think, you know, mobile spine tumors, that we do think that there is a role for uh, aggressive surgery, with or without radiation, again, but uh, I, I do I don't think that radiation replaces, in total, the role of surgery. I think it's really finding the right combination. I think for cordoma in general and for primary tumors, we have not found that uh, balance yet. Uh, but but I think there's a balance there, and I think both are, are going to remain valid. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and the next question is. Um... Can you imagine that there's a role um, or there's a widening for metastatic um, disease um, if you're going uh, retroperitoneal or even transperitoneal uh, with, the, with the Da Vinci system? Um, and there would be one or two metastases intraperitoneal, um, usually um, found in the uh, PET, FDG PET before surgery. And you see, okay. There is this uh, spinal um, tumor, and we have got two suspicious um, or three suspicious lesions intraperitoneal. Um, when I remember uh, correctly, it was uh, sometimes the oncologist said, oh, "No, you will not be able to cure if you find two of them intraperitoneal. Then it's uh, it's it's over. It's palliation." Can you imagine that you can white the indication for surgery with your technique, with your minimal invasive technique, to these patients? Um, you know, I think realistically speaking, I think we have, to, you know, we, we, we all, I, I don't think that surgery has a curative role for metastatic disease. Uh, I think what we do is really palliative in nature. Uh, and so uh, if they're kind of in the way and there's meaning to removing them, then yes, I think otherwise um, surgery really for uh, asymptomatic metastases is just not beneficial for patients with metastatic disease where you know it's all about the microscopic disease uh, and again if there's you know stereotactic radiation does a really good job for the visceral mets for sure for non-spine mets uh, that's that's kind of sometimes easier for them i think there are uh, instances where there's previous radiation where there's um, organs at risk like the colon like you know there's things that you know they're afraid to deliver the high dose radiation for then potentially maybe uh, but uh, I don't I don't think that um, I don't think there's a curative role and that the robot would actually change that I think it would probably help us do more you know multi-level things if we need to with a minimal invasive approach without burdening our patients too much. I really do think that that's probably the case, but not probably not for curative purposes. Okay, thank you. So I'm glad that something stayed quite the same <laughs> as before. Thank you very much. So um, it was really a, a great talk. I learned so much and I, I think I have now a, a different um, view into the future of um, oncology surgery. It's really, really impressive, impressive videos. And I've never seen a tumor resection like you have shown us before. Um, this uh, talk will be on YouTube as well. Uh, thank you again for, um, for uh, talking about uh, these difficult surgery, this difficult decision making and your great, um, your great uh, techniques and results. Thank you so much. Next I appreciate week. the kind words and it's a real privilege being here. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, 
Next week, it will be um, Chris Ains, uh, Dr. Raj will host him. And um, so um, I, I would love to see you all next week on this talk. And thanks again, Ari. Um, it is a talk to remember. I, I will watch it again on YouTube immediately. <laughs> I appreciate it. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you so much. So goodbye, everybody.